Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. If I sound woozy tonight or you hear my stomach growling, it's because I did five hours at the gym in a fasted state. So excuse those things. Um, this is 15 minute chart of silver. We looked at it last night and I think in the comments someone said, glad to have you back. Um, Perfect timing, and I think my comment was, yeah, probably be perfect timing. We'll probably get a $2 drop in the overnight. <laughs> so, uh, actually, we got a buck twenty drop of uh, the price of sil uh, the price of uh, fake silver. Um, I think Ron from Ron's Basement calls it uh, unicorn fart dust. <laughs> uh, I think he must have come up with that. It's a great guy. If you haven't if you haven't seen his channel, look up Ron's Basement on YouTube. I think that guy is hilarious. He is, he's great. But anyway, so we had this drop today and uh, I wanted to bring up the indicators because I wasn't logged in last night and uh, so I didn't get to discuss them. And... Um, the reason why I wanted to bring up the indicators is because uh, it's uh, often used by traders, technical traders, to establish exit and entry points in the market. And so it's something to keep an eye on. Now, there's a lot of indicators, as you can see here. There's a lot of indicators. I tend to use the MACD or, like I said, I use the KST. This is no sure thing. It, it's just, I don't even know how it works. It's, it's basically almost all the indicators that I've found to be of any use are essentially overbought, oversold indicators. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to tell you if the price action has been so violent in a direction and is about to reverse. So you can see here on the 15 minute chart, you can see it looks like we might have a reversal here because uh, we've got this little um, kind of bottoming in the indicator. Matches this one here, although this one was much lower. Another brutal sell off at uh, this, this trend line. So that's interesting in and of itself. But um, Looking at the indicators, let's go in reverse this time and let's let's go out to the weekly and, and work our way back. So you can see that this particular indicator hit a level of 1600, uh, actually 2000 in 1979. It didn't get anywhere near that in 2011. It got up to about 600. Uh, we're sitting at 200 in the indicator. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it just, it's not perfect in any sense. It's just a piece of information if you're trading. And what I found for technical trading, the best indicator is one that it trends up with an uptrending market, trends down. And the signals, usually the signals are a crossover. So let's let's pull into the daily and get some better ones. So we want to look at, for example, let's go from 2011. We're going to call this a bear market here from 2011 down to the COVID low. So that's a drop of from roughly 50 bucks down to I think it was 12 bucks. Yeah. 50 bucks to 12 bucks. Pretty serious bear market over the span of roughly nine years. And so, how do you use an indicator on this? So, um, let's say we're, we're in a bear market. We know we're in a bear market. And so, we're going to use the sell signals on the indicator. The sell signals are going to be when the indicator crosses over to the downside or to the upside and often the zero line. These are the key things you're looking at. Uh, a crossover and a crossover of the zero line. So 
looking at this bear market, how many sell signals did we get? So we've got our big sell signal right here. Okay, and we've got another sell signal here. We got another sell signal here, another one here, another one here and here and here. So how do you know if it's working? Well, the way you know the indicator is working is that if you're in a bear market and you get a sell signal, then, and you sell it, then the next time you get a sell signal, you should be at a lower price. And again, you should be in another lower price and another lower price. Now, if the indicator stops working or starts going sideways, then that's an indication that you may have a change in direction in the market. So let's just suppose, let's call the COVID low a, let's just assume it is a reversal in the market. So you get a big buy right here and more of a buy, you know, remember crossing the zero line. So here's one and we get another one down here. So we got a buy at a low price. The next buy was right here and it's a higher price. And the next buy is right here. It's at a higher price. But the next buy is right here, it's at a lower price. So that tells you you're in a sideways market or a changing market. Here's another buy, that's at a lower price. Another buy at a lower price. So let's just take the period from in 2022. So we'll start with this buy signal here is July of uh, 2022. We got a buy signal. Next time we got a buy signal is right here, March of 23. We're at a higher price, so the indicator is working. Um, are we going to call this a buy signal and this a buy signal? That's up to you. Uh, this buy signal, yeah, we're, we're at a higher price. This buy signal, we're at a higher price. This buy signal, we're at a higher price. Are we generating a buy signal right now? So that's that's how I use these indicators, overbought, oversold indicators. Again, it's just it's just some information. That's really all you can use it for. Uh, when when a market is running away, when a market is going insane, then the indicators can become useless. For example, Let's examine the 1979 run up. So silver ran from down four or five bucks, mid 70s, Carter administration. We really had it, at, we took off in 1979. So we got a clear breakout here in the signal, but it just didn't even look back. Uh, we didn't even get across over here. Uh, so it, it, it can become crazy in either a bear market or in a bull market. It's just informational. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is the volume. Uh, now this is silver, US dollars, uh, OANDA, whatever that is. My understanding is this is COMEX contracts on here. So the way that you can look at volume on trading view is you just put your cursor, get it down to whatever your time frame is. I use uh, just regular candlesticks, but um, you can use whatever you want. But the way you get the volume is you put your cursor over it and then up in here is your volume. So I want to look at one. This is an interesting one here. You can see this was back in this was the week of March 7th, 2022. So we're going to look at this week. Um, so we put the cursor on here. And if you look up, 
way up here we got 1.6 million. So in that week we did 1.6 million comics contracts. And you can see that this, it's a green volume spike, but don't put a lot of stock in that. Um, but it's a, it's a heavy volume and it's a reversal. We were trending up to the trend line. We had crossed over this 26. You see, this 26 is very key. I talked about that yesterday. And then we got the smackdown on very high volume and a big, big correction. So we're talking 1.6 million was the volume. Uh, so just we'll, we'll pull up the calculator real quick. And I'm not going to do the math in front of you, but if you can read this, um, if you can't, I'll, I'll read it to you. But basically, it, I just multiplied 1.6 million times 5,000. So you had 1.6 million contracts traded in that week times the size of the contracts, 5,000 ounces. It comes to 8 billion ounces of silver that was traded in that week. Now, I just did a real rough back of the matchbook estimate uh, just to get an idea of, you remember that we had, uh, we have 1 billion ounces or so. We're going to say 1 billion ounces of silver used in a year. So just on a, not even close, but just for guesstimates, we just divide the 1 billion ounces by 52 weeks to get how many ounces were traded uh, how, how many ounces should have been delivered in a week? Okay, because if we're using, and I'm not saying that the COMEX is all the delivery, I'm just, again, this is very rough, but just to give you an idea, you've got 1 billion, and we'll divide that by 52 weeks. So if our contract, and the contracts are on a monthly basis, but we're just going to assume they're on a weekly basis, it comes to 19 million, we're going to call it 20 million. And then we're going to talk about what's mined every year, and that was 800 million. We're going to divide that, uh, I'm sorry, not, not, uh, um, sorry, that's not right. 8 billion is the, the amount that we had uh, in that week. We're going to divide that 8 billion by 20 million, which is what should have been delivered. And the answer is 400. So, and that's a lot of people throw that number around. That's one to 400, one to 500. But basically, that's a back of the matchbook estimate of how many paper ounces are traded for every physical ounce. That means 399 paper ounces were traded that week for every one physical ounce of silver. So that makes you ask the question, what is going on here? Why is this happening? We know that 8 billion ounces is eight times the entire usage in a year. And that was in one week. What is the point of all this? And who's doing it? So we're going to assume that one out of the 400 is a legitimate hedger or a legitimate miner or a legitimate buyer who wants silver. But what are these other 399 out of 400 contract, uh, 400, 399 out of 400 ounces? What, what, what is this silver doing or who, who's buying it? Uh, so someone's buying an enormous amount of silver who has no intention of taking delivery of it and someone who has no silver is selling it with no intention of delivering it. Did I say that wrong? Um, no intention of buying it and no intention of delivering it. So we have two parties who are trading something and the manufacturer will say whether it's, you know, whatever it is, widgets, corn, doesn't matter. Uh, the miner, manufacturer, agriculture, uh, farmer. Um, that's not the person doing this. This is someone pretending to have something that they don't. 
and then someone pretending to buy something that they don't want. <laughs> so that's that's the pure insanity of this thing. Um, that's what's going on. That's what happened today. Today's volume, pull up the daily volume. Um, you can see we had this kind of bizarre reversal, but it happens fairly often. So our volume for a Friday was 110, we'll just say 110,000 uh, contracts. So what is 110,000 contracts? Um, let's just do it to make sure I'm, I'm not wrong on it. Um, 110,000 times 5,000. So today they bought and sold 550 million ounces of silver. And 399 out of 400 of those buyers and sellers were people who had no intention of taking the silver and the other side didn't have any silver to sell. So that's pretty crazy. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time on Bitcoin. So if you're not into crypto, probably you just tune out at this point. Uh, let's go and take a look at the BTC chart and if I use those synonymously, I don't intend to, so correct me, because as you're going to see, BTC is not necessarily Bitcoin. But uh, the price today, we're looking at $64,000, and let's pull up the indicators. So we're on the weekly, so you can see... Uh, on the weekly, we are on a sell as far as the uh, overbought, oversold indicators. We're, we're heading down. Um, did the bottoms work? Yeah, the bottom, the buy signals have worked ever since this uh, bear market changed over. So let's let's pull up the other BTC chart. This one's better. Um, so we got a buy signal here. Uh, we rose, the next buy signal was here, that worked. Next buy signal was here. Didn't really work until we got a buy signal here. If you took it, then you're happy because the next one came here, that one worked. And our next buy signal is right here. So is BTC putting in a top? That's, that's the big question. Uh, pull it in closer, maybe to an hour. Yeah, it's it's just hard to say. Uh, let me pull up my other chart because... Uh, oh, was that BTC Euro? No, that's BTC US Dollar. So, yeah, it's looking toppy to me. Looking toppy, but it is in new highs area. So a backfill to support is going to come in around 60,000. So who's to say? It, it might be topping, but uh, it might just take off. Who knows? But let's, let's get to the main point of what we're talking about here with Bitcoin, BTC, and all the rest of these cryptocurrencies. So let's take a look at the white paper. Now, many people read the white paper. I read the white paper. I'm not genius level like whoever this person is, Satoshi Nakamoto, who penned this back in, what was it, 2008, 2009. But it's titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So, boy, there's a lot. There's a lot right there in the title. It's got to be peer to peer. It's got to be electronic. It's got to be cash. 
A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network, and it goes on. So the rest of the time we're going to spend discussing these concepts and what do you think, what do I think, what does this all mean? So the first question when you're looking at a cryptocurrency, now let's jump over to Coinbase. We've got how many? It says we've got 11,692 assets here. Uh, these are listed by market cap, so you can see, I think the last time I talked about crypto hitting a trillion, it was a long time ago, maybe it was 2013, 14, I can't remember, but you can see now that Bitcoin itself, or oops, BTC is 1.3 trillion market cap, Ethereum comes in second, 428 billion market cap, Tether, which is we're not going to talk about stable coins. And Binance coin, uh, I don't know what that is. Is that, uh, I mean, I don't know what the purpose is. I guess you can get discounts on Binance. I don't believe U.S. citizens are allowed to trade on Binance or there's a Binance U.S. exchange. I think, what's his name? I don't remember the guy's name, the big Binance guy. Didn't he go to jail? I think so. Um, Solana comes in at $61 billion. USD and other USDC and other stable coin. So we're going to look at that. XRP comes in at 27 billion. Dogecoin, <laughs> $18 billion for Doge. Uh, no, what's that supposed to do? I don't know. So we're probably maybe two trillion. The entire crypto market is two trillion market cap. So that's that's pretty significant amount of money. But let's get back to Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? Well, it's in the white paper. And these are some questions that you should ask yourself. If you intend to buy a cryptocurrency, is it Bitcoin? Now, the price that everyone's looking at, the price we just looked at, is BTC. Is BTC Bitcoin? Well, I wrote down some questions and... These are the questions that you need to ask. Remember, Bitcoin is an idea. I did one of the original Bitcoin videos that I did was called Bitcoin, an idea whose time has come. And I got the quote from Victor Hugo talking about all the armies of the world. Everything in the world stacked against it uh, cannot defeat an idea whose time has come. So Bitcoin is an idea. A lot of people think that bit, you know, BTC is Bitcoin, or some. A lot of people think BCH is Bitcoin. A lot of very small number of people think BSV is Bitcoin, or many, many others. But what exactly is Bitcoin? Well, we know that Bitcoin is decentralized. The white paper tells us that to be Bitcoin, you have to be decentralized. We also know that it has to have a fixed supply. There has to be a limit on the number that can ever exist. If that's not the case, then it's not Bitcoin. There might be a cryptocurrency. It might be useful. It might have a very valuable function, but it's not Bitcoin. Is it proof of work? Now, a lot of you might not know what's the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. Proof of stake is basically uh, it's kind of a voting system based on how many coins you hold. And proof of stake has absolutely nothing to do with the Bitcoin white paper. Bitcoin is strictly a proof of work concept. If, you, if it's not proof of work, it's simply not Bitcoin. Now, the next is, is it fast? So this is... A big issue and we can talk about you know the Bitcoin 
hodlers, the Bitcoin only people. I don't even know the terms. This is all Bitcoin community stuff. But there's a lot of people who want Bitcoin to be digital gold, which essentially it is digital gold. I, I don't know. I haven't sent a Bitcoin in so long. I can't even recall. But... I don't know what the current transaction time is and I don't know what the current transaction cost is. But if we're looking at the white paper, clearly it's to be a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. If the transactions don't clear in a reasonable amount of time or the cost of the transaction is prohibited, then it's not Bitcoin. That's just basic. So is it fast? Can it actually be used? Now, how fast is fast? If you want to send a certain amount of cryptocurrency to some person in Africa who uh, might be one of the countries that doesn't have a stable currency and has adopted cryptocurrencies or the people have adopted it, maybe even the government tolerates it, maybe it's a a crypto friendly government such as El Salvador, or maybe we're going to see that in Argentina. We don't know. But, um, you know, if you're sending it across the world to another person, uh, what's fast? Well, if it gets there in a minute, that's, that's pretty darn fast. It's going to be a lot faster than, uh, a lot of other things that people use. Uh, I don't know if you've tried to buy things with a bank wire, but I've had to wait a week before my wire went through. So bank wires are not fast. Is uh, Visa, MasterCard fast? Yeah, they're fast. Can Bitcoin be that fast? I think so. But can BTC be that fast? Intentionally, no. Now, these are some other ones that I've added just for my own research. And this is some of the questions that I ask when I'm looking at a cryptocurrency. Is there a desktop wallet? In other words, can you download the blockchain? Now, originally when I started out, when I was doing mining and things like that, the blockchain was very, very tiny. It took up a tiny amount of space. And we can go all into Moore's Law and the expansion of processing power, the expansion of space and all these things. But uh, originally you just had the whole blockchain. And everybody had a copy of the blockchain. That was that was what was going on. And then there were the miners. So uh, that's a question that I ask: is is there a is there a usable functional desktop wallet? Now this is this is not that hard to do. If you want to find out, assuming that you have some of the crypto, whichever coin it is, if if you have some. Maybe a friend can send you some, or if you have a Coinbase account, you could buy some. But if you have it, uh, you know, throw a desktop wallet on this computer, throw a desktop wallet on that computer, and send some crypto back and forth. Uh, what's the time? How fast does it go? What is the transaction cost? How little can you send? All kinds of things like that. So that's something that I look at if I'm interested in a cryptocurrency. I'm going to test it. I'm going to make sure it has. Now, a desktop wallet opposed to what? Well, a web wallet. Why is that important? Because that's a central point of failure. If that website goes down, if that web wallet gets hacked, it, then it's gone. Is it a low transaction cost? I just talked about that. Is it recoverable by seed? And now I, in the early days when I think I did a couple of videos about cold wallets and things like that, paper wallets, cold wallets, things like that, writing down your private keys, keeping copies of your private keys, all this stuff. But uh, a lot of coins now have a, a mnemonic seed phrase. So that's another thing that you can test. So you like a crypto, you think it might be something you want. Go ahead and download the desktop wallet. Um, go to another computer, download the desktop wallet. Get somebody who's a miner or somebody that you know to send you some of the coins, send it back and forth. Check out how fast it goes, check out the transaction cost. And then if it's one that has a mnemonic seed, uh, 
write down your seed phrase on a piece of paper or, you know, copy it. You might not want to keep it in digital form <laughs> in case you got a hacker broke into your computer or you've got a Trojan or you've got a key logger. Uh, there's a lot of ways to lose it. So keep that in mind. But let's say you just, you you know, pick a coin that has a seed phrase. You download a couple of wallets, send it back and forth. Looks good. Okay. So you take the balance and send it all to the other one. And then you write down the seed phrase and you wipe your computer of that desktop wallet and every wallet file and every single thing. Redownload that desktop wallet and pop in your seed phrase. Does it pull up that account? Does it pull up that history? There you go. Then you know. These are all things that you pretty much have to do yourself. I think one of the problems with Bitcoin was that if you remember in the early days, there were all kinds of companies that came out that were in the business of the transaction. They were writing incredible amounts of software to, to integrate it with payment systems, all kinds of stuff like that. That all broke when the transaction costs went through the roof, when the transaction time went through the roof. Uh, that stuff went by the wayside. So the next questions that I want to ask are, is it rehypothecated? So what is rehypothecation? There's a lot of definitions out there, but we'll just take one of these out on the internet. Rehypothecation is an alternative name for repledging. In the derivatives market, rehypothecation is sometimes called reuse. However, the term reuse is also applied in the repo market for the onward outright sale of collateral by a repo buyer to a third party in the cash market. This has caused some confusion. It goes on and on and on. I'll throw a link to this. But let's go back to our silver. So if we're trading 399 ounces of silver for every one real ounce of silver, paper silver, 399, physical silver, one, that's a type of rehypothecation. So basically, if enough people decide to take delivery at the same time, it's not there. It doesn't exist. Now, in an honest market, let's say what I would say would be an honest silver market. I would expect that a buyer would have to pledge a certain percentage of the cash that he wants to put up to buy that silver. And a seller would have to pledge a certain amount of silver. They'd actually have to put that silver on deposit to be able to back those contracts. But that's not what happens in silver. And I'm going to imply here that that's not what's happening in crypto. So let's get back to our list here. Is it rehypothecated? Are there, I will say, are there multiple owners of the same asset? When the musical, when the music stops, when we're in a game of musical chairs and the music stops, and there's one chair and there's 400 people who gets the chair. Now the next one is, is it private? Now Bitcoin or we'll say BTC or BCH or the other forks, splits, varieties, whatever you want to call them, they're public. So the big issue you know when bitcoin first came out people were like well nobody can tell who's sending it to it. well no that's the, it's a public ledger it's open to the public which addresses sent to which addresses that's the entire point of it now private cryptocurrencies are different they don't have a public ledger they have a public private key in there no one knows who's sending who to what uh, now that was 
not part of the white paper, but that was something that this person, Satoshi Nakamoto, was talking about as the next step. And those steps were never taken. With BTC specifically, the block size never expanded and privacy was never addressed. So back to our list. Is it cheap? Now, cheap is relative because, you know, that's, it's all going to factor in with how useful it is, how fast it is. Is it a limited supply? But let's just go through these real quick and just say you're a first time investor and you're trying to use this list. All right. So we've got the term Bitcoin, but actually it's, it's BTC. Is BTC decentralized? Well, certainly BTC before it forked was decentralized. It's arguable whether it is still decentralized, especially when we're talking about nodes that are outside of the main blockchain to speed the whole deal up because it's so slow and expensive, then you could argue no. It's no longer this, sorry about that. You could argue it's no longer decentralized. So, is it a fixed supply? Yes, it's a fixed supply. Is it proof of work? Yes, it's proof of work. Again, we're talking about BTC. Is it fast? Absolutely not. It is not fast in any way. Is there a desktop wallet? Yes. Do you want the whole blockchain? I don't I don't know what size it is right now. I don't know how big the BTC blockchain is. Is it low transaction cost? No. Most certainly not. Is it recoverable by seed phrase? No. But is that important? Probably not very important. Is it rehypothecated? That's a big question. Is it private? No, it's not private. Is it cheap? No, it's not cheap. There's a lot of no's for BTC. Ethereum. Is it decentralized? No. Is it a fixed supply? I think so. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe not. Is it proof of work? I don't know. Is it fast? I don't think so. Is there a desktop wallet? No, there isn't. Is it low transaction cost? I, I don't think so. Is it re recoverable by seed? I don't think so. Is BTC Bitcoin? No. Is Ethereum Bitcoin? No. BNB? No. Solana? Don't know enough about it. XRP? No. Dogecoin? I don't know. So... For Bitcoin to exist, for Bitcoin to work, it has to have these things. Now, I told you I covered Victor Hugo and his point about an idea whose time has come. Now, that, that idea, I believe, is, is excellent and accurate. And I think it's real. If you remember when Bitcoin first came out, we had endless articles on it's going to get hacked, it's going to get broke, it's going to get this, it's going to get that. It never happened. Did, did it prove that the idea works? I think it did. I, 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 think, I don't think anybody can really argue that it didn't prove it. Maybe Peter Schiff. 
Uh, but uh, it it proved itself. Now, does that mean BTC isn't going to crash? Uh, no, absolutely not. BTC is not what it was before it forked. What is? So what is Bitcoin? Is there anything out there that's Bitcoin? Well, I have a couple of ideas, but um, I'm not going to give investment advice. But these are the questions you need to ask yourself. And you need to do your own due diligence, do your own research. I think it is an idea whose time has come. Um, let's look at some of them. There's Litecoin. If you remember, Litecoin was the silver to Bitcoin's gold. You can look at, see the chart on Litecoin basically started out around a couple bucks. And we've got a very, very, very long trend line. We're at 73 bucks. So Litecoin ran all the way up to 400, a couple of times, crashed. But it's, it's in a slow rise. Um, I don't know enough about implementation of Lightning Network and things like that. I mean, doing things that are outside of the scope of the white paper is, you know, to make it faster rather than increasing block size, that's, that's kind of cheating in a way and can be dangerous because it can lead to rehypothecation. So is Bitcoin or I should say, is BTC rehypothecated? Are any, are, are any of these, or many of these, rehypothecated? Because rehypothecation in silver is what's going on. Rehypothecation allows for the selling and buying of artificial, counterfeit versions of the real thing. If BTC and the Lightning Network and these things, and Experts correct me. I haven't followed it that closely lately. And I certainly don't own any. But if BTC is rehypothecated because of nodes, because of transaction times, because of things like that, then it's just another silver. They're just going to trade fake BTC for fake BTC. They, they will control the price. They can put the price to quote Bixware. They can put the price wherever they want with the click of a mouse. So that's where we're at with crypto. I think there's a great future for Bitcoin. But the biggest question is, where is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? You tell me. We'll talk to you next time.